What up, what up, Thought Warriors? Welcome to Higher Learning. It's time to put your thinking caps on. I am Van Lathan. And loud, I'm Rachel Lindsay. I got to turn down my volume with you. You turn down your volume. You, okay, <laughs> well, look, we'll start there. We'll start with Rachel sort of playing into commonly held stereotypes about wow. African-Americans. So, so, uh, is, that how, is that how the whole show's popping off? You're just going to rag not, on me. That's that's the energy we're setting this whole show. I got it. See, I'm, see, I'm ready. I just need to and, be ready. And what we're doing now, it's called passing the buck because you started <laughs> by criticizing me. You, you're the one. Oh, you loud. Like, you, like, you know, you want okay, me to- Okay, first like, of all- for all you watching the video, you will see how he just imitated me when he said, I said oh, you loud. First of all, there were no fingers. There was no head movement. Mm -hmm. I'm good, though. I feel good. I was a, a little bit under the weather the last time we recorded. Ooh, I'm, feeling, update, dun, I'm, feeling, dun, dun. I'm feeling much better. Uh -huh. Great. I'm feeling good. Mm -hmm. I feel refilled. Okay. You know, shout out to you. I gave you a shout out on Twitter for giving me the quote that kind of carried me through to where I am wow. today. Wow. Did you such like a, that? I just just, just a, showing love to my co-host. Such a Trump administration move by you right there. Whoa, the that's two. All right. But, well, I mean, no, but we, let, let's talk about in. it. We <laughs> talked about yesterday. I sort of derided the quote of you can't pour from an empty cup. I go on Twitter and <laughs> Rachel has posted on her Twitter, you can't pour for an empty cup from an empty cup, dash Van Lathan. And I got people <laughs> hitting me up like, yo, Van, yo. Yo, dog, that's deep, dog. Exactly what I said. Thank you, Rachel. By the way, I, I appreciate you. You're welcome. You, like, like giving me a little, little snipe right there. You're welcome. I actually, after that, did another podcast or something. And I was like, you know, like my co-host says, you can't pour out of an empty cup. Oh, my God. I, I didn't <laughs> say that. That is not a Van Lathan quote. I did not. Say the porn from an empty cup thing. Stop it. I hate that. <laughs> no, it's so good. How are mm. you, Van? I feel like I never say, how are you doing? Uh, I'm not well. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I'm not well because of some things that, you know, have happened uh, uh, over the course of this week, the last couple of days, some really incredibly uh, devastating news has become a reality for me and all of my friend group um and we lost somebody but i don't want to start the podcast off like that i will talk about that a little bit later on and some some greater things uh that have to do with the way in which we lost this person and kind of the moment that we're in um but i appreciate the ability to even say that i'm not well like it yeah it, it's it's freeing to have the space to be able to be like yo you know for right now you know, I'm I'm not doing so hot. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, um, and I think to be able to honor that, I, I remember in, in therapies one time, someone, not someone, my therapist said, you need to just sit and feel exactly what it is that you're feeling. Because too mm. often we try to brush things under the rug to try to move it on or mask it with something else to distract ourselves rather than just being present in the moment and actually feeling all of that. So I'm I'm proud that you're able to say that. I'm sorry for your loss. I know you don't want to talk about it right now, but. No, I mean, speaking of therapy, I will say this. Something interesting happened in therapy earlier today. I have therapy every Thursday. Dr. Coley Williams, shout out to my doctor. Um, uh, I have therapy. And normally when you leave therapy, you feel better. But I didn't feel better when I left therapy this morning. And I'll tell you why. So we're, so. I have been so bothered by what's happened. Like I'm getting up and I'm walking around while I'm doing the therapy. Like yeah. I'm walking, you know, so whatever. And she says, stop. And then we do a grounding technique because I get so worked up to where she has to, I have to ground and I have to look. It's a fantastic technique where you're looking around and you're identifying different things that you can see. Green leaves. You're spelling a street sign backwards. You're switching your brain back from a reactive mode into uh, uh, a sort of feeling hmm. mode. Okay? okay. You're grounding yourself. Um, but your, your brain gets too reactive and you get all clogged up. So we do all of this and I'm doing, I'm on the street and I'm spelling words on a sign backwards, which you look completely crazy. Like, Oh, there's main street, uh, in I a M, you know, it's the whole deal. Um, we leave the, we were getting ready to go. And she goes, well, what are you doing Tuesday morning? 
And I said, uh, I'm just, you know, hanging out, playing Madden, whatever. She goes, let's go ahead and schedule an additional therapy session <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for Tuesday morning. And I'm like, what? She's like, yeah, let's go two, two days a week next week. I, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, well, you need an extra day? Like, I, I need an extra day? Like, what, what, what are you seeing? Don't worry about it. I don't want you to worry about it. You know, <laughs> just, just, just get an extra day. It's like, it's like um, when your doctor says, hey, ha, we saw something on your ultrasound. Don't worry about it. Just get here in the next 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, yo, what's wrong? But uh, I've we're been working. there before. Yeah, it's 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 scary. We're working through it though. We're working through it. And and you're doing, but you're doing okay. That's the most important thing. You're doing okay. I I physically feel better. Yes, thank mm. you. So I think the most interesting thing. I mean, obviously, we're going to talk uh, about the ongoing uh, protest and civil unrest uh, unrest that exists in America. That is still top of mind conversation. But there is something that is going to. Uh, supplant that, at least for now, as the lead of our show. Um, and I don't want anyone to take that as in, uh, as if we're saying there's anything more important to discuss uh, than what's happening at the moment that we're in right now in America. But um, I saw a fantastic documentary a couple of nights ago. It was Tuesday night on HBO Max, um, which is interesting because HBO Go just turned into HBO Max overnight. I'm like, hey, I got HBO Max. I didn't even know. I didn't sign up for it, whatever. Um called On the Record, On the Record, and it details uh, three women specifically and their allegations against Russell Simmons. If you guys don't know who Russell Simmons is, uh, Russell Simmons is the uh, one of the founders of Def Jam Records. I would say that in the mechanism by which we understand it now, in the way that we understand it now, Russell Simmons was the godfather and almost the chief architect of hip hop. Uh, at least the business side of it, not sure. the music side of it, not necessarily the culture side of it. But in starting Def Jam Records, uh, he laid the foundation for many other record labels that will go on to become um, to make up what we understand hip hop culture to be right now. He yeah. His importance to the history of rap and hip hop music simply cannot be overstated. Right. Uh, but in this documentary, you have three women that allege that. During the 90s and during the 80s, I believe, um, they were raped by Russell yeah. Simmons. Now, you have way more people, way more women uh, that have alleged various degrees of misconduct against Russell. Uh, but in this documentary, three women tell their stories. I know that you saw it. What did you think? So, first of all, thank you for putting this on my radar because I did not know about this documentary. You told me about it. I watched it and I'm just, I don't know if I'm, I'm floored, but I, I, I guess I've, I'm feeling similar feelings that I felt when I watched the R. Kelly documentary. Mm. Kind of like, how did I not know this was happening? I heard it, but I didn't research it. I didn't really delve into it. We all heard when he, when Russell Simmons was being accused because it came out during the Me Too movement when Harvey Weinstein, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. he was being accused as well, um, but I, I mean, I'm watching this and I find these women extremely credible, extremely credible in their stories. I mean, and for those of you who haven't watched it, it's just not some some random person. These are people that were an A&R executive, a mm -hmm. friend of Russell Simmons, um, an artist. And then there are 20 women who have made accusations since, I guess, since this all came out, since the first one did. And so we see the stories of three and then a, a fourth one comes along towards mm -hmm. the end. I mean, so I'm a person, before I get into this, I'm a person who when I'm watching something, I go down a dark hole and start researching at the same time I'm actually watching it. Are you like that? Mm -hmm. Of course. Of oh, course. Three, or three screens lathing. I got the, <laughs> I, <laughs> I oh, three screens is what they call me. I got the TV screen going, the computer screen going, then the phone, all three screens. That's what they call me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Three screens. Well, I, I'm two screens, but I definitely have my phone in my hand. So I'm reading the backstory about this documentary and seeing the involvement of Oprah. So I can't yes. tell you this without, without talking about Oprah's involvement. So long story short, this was supposed to come out on Apple 
and Oprah Winfrey was backing this and pulled out weeks before it was about to premiere at the Sundance Festival because she says she pulled out because of creative differences. Russell Simmons says she pulled out because he pressured her and had other people who were backing his story. I don't know where the truth lies in that, but I just think the fact that Oprah Winfrey was involved with this and I mean, pretty much saw it all the way through until three weeks before says a lot. And the, and the whole time I was watching this, I just couldn't help but tie it into what's happening right now in our country and how we're bringing to light how Black women and their stories are not valued to the level of other stories. And in this social caste system that we have in the United States, Black women are at the bottom of the totem pole. And so the fact that these women's stories aren't deemed credible or deemed believable, no charges have been filed against Russell Simmons. L.A. Reid is uh, implicated as well in this documentary. And the fact that these women were afraid to come out and they talk about being a Black woman, and then you turn it to what's happening right now in our country about how the stories and the murders of Black women at the hands of the police are not being recognized to the level of as black men, it just shows how problematic things are, not just in our country, but for me also in the black community. Mm. I feel like I just went on a ch- <laughs> a, the wrong tangent, but these are all the thoughts that I had when mm-hmm. I was watching this documentary. Say more about what you feel about your place within the black community is like, to, like as a black talk, woman, as a black woman. Sure. What do you mean? I mean, I understand. I know what you mean, but talk a little bit more about that, if you don't mind. I mean, I'm not interviewing you. I'm just saying oh. <laughs> oh, I feel like I feel like a lot of sisters feel this way. And how specifically do you feel? Do you feel? I mean, as black women, we don't feel valued in the same way that other members of this society are, whether you're a white man, a white woman, black man, any other race. I, I have always felt as a black woman that our voices weren't heard, that we are stereotyped to a certain way. It's even referenced in this documentary how there is this sexuality, like we're very sexual in nature. And that's how we're looked at by other men, as opposed to who we are as a black woman and what we can bring to the table. And so hearing the stories of these women with Russell Simmons, going back to R. Kelly and the way that he values black women or treated black women. And then what's happening in our country right now with the Breonna Taylors and their stories not being recognized. It's just, it's just a reminder of how hard and how loud we have to scream as black women to be heard and to be seen. Mm. Do and, you and, feel unseen by black men? Oh, Yes, okay. definitely. We're talking, I definitely. Like, we're talking about like, yeah, I, just, well, like, I talk, yeah. I definitely feel see, unseen by black men at times. There's there's a there's a line or there's a conversation that happens between mm-hmm. these women. It's towards the end of this documentary, and as you see these three women sitting in this mm-hmm. in this room talking and sharing about their experience and really just relating to one another, and then one of them says, I believe it was Drew, who talks about that they all look alike. They're all light-skinned women Mm -hmm. with a certain texture of hair. And Drew says, as Black women, she's talking about their voices not being valued. And then she says, I felt like I had to speak up because I'm a light-skinned Black woman and I know that I at least get a little bit more I'm a little bit more recognized than than for the darker skinned mm-hmm. black women. That's I'm paraphrasing mm-hmm. what she says, but that's that's basically what she's saying. And so I thought that that was a powerful thing because it also shows how black women are treated within the black community as as mm-hmm. well. That I, I remember going to school and being told oh, hearing from certain black men, oh, we only date black women who look like this, or we date outside of our race because we don't want to date a black woman who looks like this. And there are these Mm -hmm. stereotypes that exist within our own community that I found interesting that also came up within this documentary as well. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. And I have to ask this question. You do want to interview me today. No, no, I'm not. No, I'm asking you. I'm asking you. Do you feel like that and this is this is, oh, this is gonna. Where are you going what? with this? What are you about to wait, say? Wait, <laughs> wait, wait, seriously. Do you feel like that has anything to do the feelings that you're having about maybe why you didn't marry a black guy? Did you feel unappreciated by black is, men? I knew well, this oh, was no, no, I'll tell you why I asked you, know you that. I asked you that because it's a lot of it's a lot of dudes right now, a lot of brothers that you know they see Rachel Lindsay and they go. Damn, Rachel Lindsay's smart. And, and then they see your husband and they go, oh, shit, look at that. And when they hear you talking right now, I promise you, you just put a bunch of brothers in their feelings because well, they thinking she's saying all of this. But yet she's not with the black guy. 
You know what I'm saying? Like this is a what great you- question that I am so happy to address because okay. And and first of all, I knew this was gonna come up. We're in episode five. I'm, I'm actually shocked it took this long, man. I'm actually shocked you didn't question me before. But here we are. Okay. So the world met me on TV dating on The Bachelor, where The Bachelor was white. Mm-hmm. Then I go on my season and I end up with a Colombian man who you may not know that by looking at him, but you learn later. Whatever. Just right. by sight, you can't really tell. Right. So people think that I don't date black men. Mm-hmm. Little do they know prior well, you don't to now. Well, prior to ever coming <laughs> on the show, that's right. all I dated. Mm. And I kind of had to reason with myself of knowing that when I was going to go on The Bachelor, that the the type of man black man that I date is not going to come on this show. I know that. Take that with, with your Wait, can I just make an announcement? If you, if you listen to our podcast, please also watch it on the YouTube channel so you can understand what's happening here because you don't want to miss these facial expressions and these reactions. What what kind of what kind of black man did you date? I I I what we're talking about DMX? Earl no, Simmons? I'm just saying they wouldn't come on The Bachelor. There's just a certain type of I, I you know what? I'll put it this way. Okay. When I yeah. was on the when I was on The Bachelorette. Mm-hmm. Majority, there might have been two men out of the out of all the black men. There were two of them who dated black women in okay. conversation. I learned that the black men on my season did not date black women, except for two they, of them. Right. So that's a certain type of man. That's what I'm saying. As a black woman, does it bother you when a black man doesn't date black women? No, because I, be, I well, I well, if you say, I'm not going to date black women, then I have a problem that you don't want to date your own race. If you're mm-hmm. interested in dating everyone, that's great. I wasn't mm-hmm. until I was in my 30s that I said, you know what? I'm going to start really dating outside of my race. Mm-hmm. And I encourage other people. Like, I was so like, <laughs> I'm getting so personal. I was like, you know what? My sister married a white man. I cannot, I like, I got to be a black man. <laughs> You could like you're like I don't want my parents to go over for two. You know what I mean? Know, like Ugh. legit, that was my thinking. And then I was just like, you know what, Rachel, you just got to open yourself up. I was in a five year relationship with a black man. I thought this was it. It didn't work out. Mm-hmm. After that, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to be open up and date who I connect with. And so that's right. when I started dating outside of my race. Obviously, it worked out for me. But back to what you were saying. I, I grew up hearing black men say that all the time. That never stopped me from dating a black man. I just thought I don't want to date that black man because that Word. black man isn't interested in me. But it didn't stop me from dating black men in general. And that's the only issue that I have. I can't stand people who say I don't date a specific, their own race. I can't mm. stand that in any race. I feel like if you want to date other races, that's a beautiful thing. That's great. But I can't stand people who condemn their own race. Very, very against that. That's the type of brother that I don't like. Right. Right. Self-hatred. So I, 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 the reason why I wanted to, to kind of get your full take on the documentary is because seriously, like this is a sticky subject from a lot of different areas, right? I watch the women and I believe them 100%. Uh, Yeah. And that, and that, that, that's difficult to say. I'll tell you why it's it, it's difficult to say. Yeah, because, why is that difficult? Because it's Russell Simmons. And I'm going to be honest with you right now. Like, Russell Simmons, look, when you're a young black guy, right? When you're a young black man, you start, the first thing you start, well, for me, the first thing I worshipped was God, right? Like, yeah. like this, Jesus, give me Jesus. They give me who, they give me Jesus. And then right after Jesus came Michael Jackson, right? Listen. I was, like, we'll like, talk, like, we'll talk. Like, like right after Jesus came Michael Jackson, right? Same for me and as so, well. So it was, so it was Jesus. And then it was like, okay, like li- literally I knew who Michael Jackson was uh, before I knew who either Malcolm X or Martin Luther King Jr. was. 100%. And I was just hearing everybody was celebrating him. And then I learned about Dr. King. I learned about all these people and my world starts to get more shape. What happens is that you start to worship certain structures and one structure that you start to worship uh, and you really feel intertwined with and like a part of is hip hop. Hip hop as a young man, sports were another thing, but hip hop and film was another thing for me too, just because of my own personal interest. But hip hop gave me a voice. Hip hop yeah. gave me a way to see guys who weren't that much older than me. 
um, get out of their situations and talk to me and minister to me and give me a huge 360 degree view of the world to, um, as my brother says, to transcend my circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. And get out of where I was and understand kind of how things were in New York, understand how things were in Miami, understand how things were in Los Angeles. You know, the first time I was in the first grade, right? And I'm on the bus. This is, I remember the day I was introduced to hip hop. I'm on the bus and we just riding, right? We're riding from the class to this lady that used to keep kids. One day I'm going to tell a story about what happened to her husband the day I walked on some tables and he decided that he was going to whip me with a belt. Ooh. He whipped me with a belt. Dallas, Texas. My father's reaction to this was fucking amazing. <laughs> Once my dad heard this, I'm glad that it didn't go as far as I thought it was going to go. I was very scared. Uh, but anyway, we're on the way to we're on the way there, and I hear somebody in the background. I hear a boy, uh, 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 a boy with a headphones on, and he's going, "No body could rap quite like I can." I take a muscle bound man and put his face in this, and I'm like, "Yo, what is he? What is he saying? Like, what is that?" And it was LL Cool J. And that was when I was introduced. That's crazy. I, you remember that. Yeah. yeah, I remember it because one side of the bus was talking about Back to the Future. And then the other side of the bus was talking about this song. And it was LL Cool J. And I, and I tried to find the song. And when I found it, I was like, yo, listen to this. Like, I was tripping. That's Russell Simmons. That's yeah. Def Jam. That's Russell Simmons. Everything that gets built after that, as far as you know, going on to to run DMC, Walk This Way, The Beastie Boys, Hove comes in, later on DMS comes in. This Jeff Jam is the spot. It was the gold standard. And at the top of this was this guy who was powerful, who dated models, who uh, who was just this, this aspirational figure that you wanted to be. Mm-hmm. And you don't, wake up one morning and form those thoughts like they're almost formed for you like for you they're formed so true like you 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 grow Def Jam grows Russell grows and as he grows your idea of what American success evolves along with it and then years later after you've gone through all of that and done all of that and been a part of all of that and loved that as much as you have, mm-hmm. you learned this. And now your character is being tested. And for everyone out there that wants to protect Russell and for everybody out there that doesn't want to believe what went on in the 90s, I get why they feel that way. But the decision is quite clear. Either you protect your sisters or you don't. And if we make excuses and if we equivocate, I don't know, if we fail to meet the mark in spots like that, like why would they trust us mm. as, as brothers, as counterparts, as companions? Like I can't look at what Drew was saying and what the other ladies are saying and say that I don't believe them yeah. because the stories seem real. Now look, Russell Simmons hasn't been convicted of anything and he deserves his chance to tell his side of the story. And we should say for the purposes of this podcast that he vehemently denies any claim of sexual assault or rape. He does. It's all alleged. Alleged. That's what we have to say. Yes. He, he admits that he was um, a womanizer. He admits that he was a playboy, a playboy garish, and that he might have put women in some situations that were uncomfortable, but not to get too graphic for you guys, Drew Dixon says that she went to a stereo to, um, and he also says something that like, there are situations to where he feels like things could have been misunderstood. Drew Dixon oh, he says, did? yeah, he says that sometimes, you know, things could be misunderstood. He can under- he can understand how things, signals got crossed. Yeah. And Everything that they said in the documentary about the culture of that era is 100% true. Mm -hmm. It was different and it was much more uh, sort of dangerous for women and things were much more cavalier. Um, 
But what she says happened was that she was over at the stereo fiddling around for a CD. And she turned around. Russell Simmons was naked with a condom on. Yes. And that he pushed her on the bed and raped her. Mm -hmm. There's no way that situation could be misunderstood. Either it happened or it didn't. And there was another woman who had a very similar story about him standing naked with a condom on. And there was another woman who said that uh, she was uh, a member of a, a, a group, a DJ group up in New York called the Mercedes Ladies, that even in the 80s that Russell Simmons held her down and raped her. Uh, I believe them. And that doesn't mean, um, obviously, you know, Russell Simmons did an interview on The Breakfast Club. I have no problem with The Breakfast Club giving him the interview. I do. Uh, to, uh, talk, let's talk about it. You have a no, problem with them I giving mean, him the interview. I do have a problem with him giving the interview. I mean, it's, because it went into the documentary. It went into the accusations that are out there against him. And I just feel like if I was if I was there, I would not have been a part of it because I don't want to make it seem like I'm complicit with the behavior that that I believe is true, right? I believe these women and what they're saying. So if I have this man on my show, then I feel like I am being complicit to that. I don't want anybody to be a part of what I'm doing. I don't want to be affiliated I don't want to be aiding and abetting mm-hmm. that who this person is and what they stand for, at least for what I believe. Because again, yes, this is all, these are accusations. He has not been, uh, uh, he had, there are no criminal charges against him as of yet. He has not been convicted of anything. But if I truly believe that what these women are saying are true, I want no parts of this man. So I'm against them giving him a platform to change the narrative, to speak about something else in a positive way when over your head is hanging these the are hanging these allegations that you mistreat women, sexually hmm. assault women. Okay. And that's a fair point. And there were a lot of people on Twitter uh, that, that made that point. The reason why I don't have a problem with the interview is R. Kelly was interviewed by Gail King. Prince Andrew got an interview on 2020. Um, if any of these networks right now had an opportunity to interview Harvey Weinstein from jail, they would take the interview. If even, even the documentary itself, Rachel, reached out <clears throat> to Russell Simmons to get his side of it. But think of the context of what they were going to talk to him about. They were going to talk to him specifically about this, not to mm-hmm. give him the opportunity to defend himself or to promote something else. You know, well, that's, R, that's well, why R. Kelly got upset. That's why well, it's an iconic well, interview right now. R, R. Kelly, R. Kelly actually did exactly what he went there to do. He went there to <laughs> yeah. freak. You know what I mean? He R. Did. Kelly, he did. yeah, he wanted to freak out. And so he went there to freak out and make a big show about how innocent he was. I don't have a problem with anyone who's accused of anything having their opportunity to speak on their own behalf. It's just the way things work. There's the interview came just so people know the breakfast club interview. It came from Bali. Uh, So he's in Bali right now. And there are many people who feel that Russell Simmons is in Bali because it's a non extradition country. Now he had been going back and back and forth to Bali for years now, but he has been in Bali since all of this coronavirus stuff happens. He says that he can't get back here, but he's also been in Bali since he knew that this this uh, this documentary was going to drop. So mm-hmm. you don't know which one that it really is. Um, for me, I don't have a problem with them giving him the interview. I don't have a problem with anyone talking to someone that's been accused of anything. Because if that's the case, then if you're going to make a decision about who it is that you believe, you kind of have to have... Uh, all of the information or as much of the information as you can. What I will have, a pro- what I do have a problem with is certain parts of what was being said. Like they, I mean, and it has nothing to do specifically with what they, you know, Russell Simmons says in the interview, he says, uh, um, well, I've taken a lie detector test and uh, I've passed nine lie detector tests. Well, my question is administered by whom? Well, those don't even hold up in court. They don't so, hold up. Number, yeah, so. number one, they don't hold up. And number two, if you're taking a lie detector test court ordered from an independent person uh, as part of a deposition for something else, then that's completely different than going out and hiring somebody on exactly. your own dime. If you if it's a part of a criminal or civil proceeding, taking a lie detector test in that ent- in that entrance is completely different than, 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 than taking a lie detector test from some dude that you go hire so that he reaffirms that you didn't do anything. But why nine times? Why nine? Why you got to do it nine times? Isn't one enough? Maybe two? Nine times? Really, Russell? Come on now. I like, I've, 
I, but but my question is, and I because I actually agree with what you're saying. It was my understanding that he was on the Breakfast Club to promote something, and then the conversation turned to that, and that's well, what there I was had no an way. issue. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, but that's what I had an issue with because he came on under the guise of promoting something. Yes, the conversation went there, but I wouldn't have even given you the opportunity to promote that. I would have said, we'll do an interview with you if you want to sit down and talk about this documentary. Yes, mm -hmm. but not to promote anything to make you look better. Mm -hmm. Well, the documentary itself dropped Tuesday. I think the Breakfast Club interview came out Tuesday or Wednesday. It came out, it was coming out, it came out Wednesday morning. So that was the night uh, after, that was the morning after the documentary dropped. So there's no way that he didn't, that the interview to do the interview with the breakfast club on Russell Simmons's part wasn't mm -hmm. tied to the release of the documentary. Mm -hmm. There, th there's no way that they weren't going to ask him about that and spend a significant amount of time, uh, in dealing with it. So that was going to happen. Um, he did say in the interview that he feels like his voice has been muted and he wants his voice back. Stuff like that is the kind of shit that gets on my fucking nerves mm -hmm. because Russell Simmons's voice is not the voice that we should be discussing. Exactly. The voices that we should be discussing and we will discuss and any of those women who want to talk, they have an open forum here. I don't think the Breakfast Club has told them they haven't gone. They couldn't go on there either, um, but they have an open forum here to come talk to us. Absolutely. I don't know what detail that they... Uh, that they didn't go into on the documentary, but if there's anything else that wants to be discussed, they're, well, they're, they're... I'll give two things that they can sure. come on and talk about. One is this interview because they were actively tweeting. At least I know Drew was tweeting about what she felt about it. And the mm -hmm. second thing is when Oprah Winfrey pulled away from doing this documentary and how that felt. Mm -hmm. I know that Drew has spoken out about it, but I would love to talk to them about how they felt probably neglected, abandoned, um, not valued in that sense and and really trying to understand why three weeks before the release of it, when pretty much everything is done, that you pull out. Yeah. I would love to have that conversation with them. Well, there's some talk. I mean, there was, it was stated that, that Oprah said she pulled out because of inconsistencies in the story of Drew Dixon in particular. It three was, weeks that was, before. Right. Three weeks before. Let me tell you what I think happened there okay. with, as much love and respect for Oprah and Gail as it is possible. Here is the thing about Why this. Why you put Gail in there? Because Gail is a part of what I'm about to say. Okay. Um, so at Oprah and Gail get lumped in together. And I'll be honest with you, I do have some issues with Oprah and Gail. I have some issues with Oprah. I, I have some issues with Oprah and Gail with the way that they've treated hip hop in the past. I have some issues with Oprah and Gail in um Gail in particular, which we've all we've talked about with uh, the way she handled the Lisa Leslie interview after Kobe Bryant had passed away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just whether or not there's enough nuance to the conversation about black men's place in the continuing discussion of sexual assault and violence in this country. OK, um, I don't think it's fair that black men become the face right. of sexual assault and sexual violence in America. I don't think that that's fair. There is a line between me not thinking that's fair and also what I'm willing to do to protect black women from mm -hmm. some of our brothers who are not getting it. Mm -hmm. And as a man, you can't be half a man. Yeah. You can't be a man when it serves your purposes and interests and be not a man when it's something that is hard for you to do and stand up of. That's no man at all. And that's yeah. not the stock that I come from. Um, but I think that when that on the heels of the Michael Jackson documentary and after the Kobe Bryant interview, the backlash from that, if you're asking me, was probably a large part of why Oprah decided that she didn't want to be a part of On the Record. Mm. Because it, it, if like Oprah says that she felt like there were inconsistencies in Drew's story. Yet she still believed her. So she had she, to say that as a I, person who's spoken out about her own experiences with something similar, she had to say that. But you, but actions speak also louder than words. And three weeks before it's about to come out, that film is done. And the mm -hmm. fact that both she and Russell 
Simmons have admitted that there was pressure put on her, it just isn't a good look. And mm. that, that I know she gave an explanation as to why she did it, but to me, it's so unsettling when you were involved right. so much into it. This didn't happen over, they didn't ask you to come on at the last minute. You were involved in this. And then you mm -hmm. pull out at the last minute. I just think it speaks volumes. Yeah. And I think it's problematic. The documentary that everyone should check it out, it goes into great detail into something else that's pretty uncomfortable is that, you know, the weaponization of sexual assault claims is a sticky subject for black men because it's one of the things that has been used to lynch, destroy, kill. Yes. Uh, um, and just take rob from black men since we've been here in America. It's been, oh, it's big black buck raped a white woman. We can talk about Emmett Till. We can talk about so many different situations to where yeah. a black man was accused of a sexual crime that he didn't do, lost his life from it, lost his career from it, you know, lost whatever. And so as we move on, even when they talked about Mike Tyson and Desiree Washington and all those things, I remember the way my father and people around me reacted to those stories and they reacted to those stories because they were triggering for them because, you know, in those stories, what you had was a, a belief that this was the way you took down a powerful black man. Even in the case of OJ Simpson, a belief that his marrying a white woman from Brentwood and that was, th that's the way you get to a black man. You send mm -hmm. Delilah in and you take them out because that's the one thing that that you get rid of. So well, well, no, I was okay. just going to add to your point. Clarence Thomas, who they also show, they show mm -hmm. the hearings of Clarence Thomas when he was being considered to be on the Supreme Court, and they show Anita Hill testifying. He says in there that this is what happens to a black man when they get there. He references that. I'm just going to add that to mm -hmm. your point. And it's also yeah, in the documentary. Very, yeah. So uh, you know, I'm saying, and when you're so when you see Russell or when you see even Bill Cosby. Uh, or any of these other people, you don't want to believe it at first. You want to believe that it's the it's the same it's the same old hat, the same old trick. You don't want to believe it. Um, but the reality is that I'm not saying, or I don't think there's anyone that's saying, or that all black men are guilty of sexual assault, or that no. the majority of black men are guilty of sexual assault, or that. There's even a prevalent, a, 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 not even a, pre a prevalence of sexual assault uh, that we are somehow more prone to it. But I am saying that that black man, yeah, I believe, is guilty of sexual assault. And if that too. means I don't get love at Def Jam, <laughs> <laughs> then I don't, I don't get love at Def well, Jam. You see. At the end of the documentary, they kind of give you an update. And although there were no criminal charges, L.A. Reid stepped down in 2017 as the chairman and CEO at Sony Music. They say don't meet your heroes. You never you never should meet the people that you admire. But I mean, these days it's feel, feeling like you don't even want to know anything about them. I don't want to know anything. And one day now is not the time. You know, we're going to have to talk about Michael. And with that, I'm going to let you change the subject. Cause you mentioned. I gotta be honest with you, it's different. But whatever. No, like, oh like, my like, you know, I gotta be honest with you, it's different. But whatever. No, no, change the what, subject. Cause, cause that will be the whole podcast. It's it's different. It's different. But whatever. It's not the same. I'm not like it's not the I same. I would just. I'll tell you what is the same. We love Michael the same. We just love see Michael, it different. We we just like, see it differently. It's just and it's not. It's different. It's I only want to get into it right now. You just brought me down. Uh, <laughs> so. Juneteenth. Are you excited about Juneteenth this year? This year. I mean, Juneteenth, I'm from Texas. So I right. feel like Juneteenth is a bigger deal in Texas more than it is nationwide. Um, am I that's, excited that's, about that's, Juneteenth? That's, that's, that's completely, no. That's, that's like, not I'm true. Not, no. That's oh, wait, not, not, wait. Not, oh you, you want to say Louisiana celebrates it even no, more? Wait, I don't, wait, I don't, you, I don't no, think there you, are a lot say, of celebrations, no, like, period, about Juneteenth. Juneteenth is June 19th, you, by the way, you're, you're, you guys. You're out of your... No, first of all, before you even what? explain to the people that don't know what Juneteenth is, you don't get to just say... I'm sick of this Texas bullshit, by the way. Like, okay, I like, barely I, I, mention like, my state. Like, but it, it's like... I, I understand that Texas is dope, right? Texas. I, like I, hit, got, I hit a sore spot. Keep going. Yeah, Go I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. <laughs> I, I am. Anyway, uh, no, Texas does not get more, have more Juneteenth celebrations. But we'll say, we should say this. Juneteenth celebrated everywhere is when you like used to get like 
the Juneteenth concert in your town is when like Roger <laughs> Troutman and Zap and like Frankie Beverly and Mays would come out and show out. It'd be crazy barbecue. Juneteenth yeah. is the celebration of the freeing of the slaves in Texas. Um, My and point. Is, Thank you. My point. Whatever. Why we celebrate it even bigger. It has become though... Uh, the, I guess, national African black, I still, why, am I, why, why, why would I even say African American? I don't say that. Is to become <laughs> the national black American celebration of the freeing of the slaves. So when you, we celebrate on Juneteenth, June 19th, there's a barbecue, there's a concert, there's whatever. Now here's the thing, like everything else, no one celebrates with us. You do not get the day off from work. True. You get nothing. A celebration of freeing the slaves, which should be one of the most joyous occasions in America, right? The mm-hmm. end, a celebration to celebrate the end of the darkest, most embarrassing period, most inhumane period in American history. Right. It's national recognition of zero right. from our country. Yikes. Whatever, guys. Um, but no, this June 19th, this Juneteenth, we got a new, we got somebody else that's celebrating with us. <laughs> Wait, is it in going on what you say about na- not getting national recognition? Don't you feel weird hearing on CNN or whatever people say Juneteenth and then explain what it is? I'm like, they've never, ever covered never anything about Juneteenth. And now it's never on cared. everybody's radar. But go right. ahead. Tell them who's celebrating with this. Who, how, how, why it's getting so much attention. J- Donald Trump. So Donald Trump, the president of, you know, whatever. Donald Trump <laughs> is having a rally. I guess his first big rally in a while. Since March 2nd. Since March 2nd in Tulsa. Now that is also significant because Tulsa is uh, the site of one of the other worst moments in American history. A lot of the worst moments in American history have to do with the treatment of black Americans, which were uh, uh, the Tulsa, the slaughter of black wall street in Tulsa, which if you guys don't know what happened, there was a thriving and sublime um, culture and part of Tulsa that, uh, that was run by black people. They had black businesses, they had banks, they had all of these great things. And, to be honest with you, uh, I think it was a false sexual assault claim. Yes, no, that, it was. Yeah, it was certainly a, a false sexual assault claim that was used as motivation for uh, the white part of Tulsa or a, a neighboring white place to go in and over the course of a couple of days, just murder black people. Mm-hmm. Just kill them up. Yeah. Uh, and these weren't race riots. This, this wasn't anything like that. This was the intentional killing of a thriving, vibrant part of Black America. Black people who were living the American dream for themselves, who had figured it out. Um, And so there's been a lot of talk about Tulsa lately. There's been a lot of talk about places like Rosewood lately. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of talk about what happened in Atlanta at the beginning of the century lately. And so I think President Trump... Seneca Village was another one. Seneca Village. I think President Trump is, uh, is seizing the opportunity here, the times that we're in, to go and talk to black people. He's doing hashtag black rally from President Trump on Juneteenth. We can't even fucking have Juneteenth now without having some weird taste in our mouth. What do you think about this? I mean, just first of all, I would like to say when Van is describing what happened in Tulsa back in 1921, when this happened, people didn't talk about it. It's it's just now, not just now, but it started to come about later no, in the later knew, years. No, you, no. You, you you can say that just now because we we always knew as for, in terms of okay. black people. We were talk, but in terms of on the national a national conversation sure. about the tragedy that happened in Tulsa, mm-hmm. it's not taught. You don't really hear about <laughs> oh, it. No. no one really discusses it at all. I think you're yeah. right. And then when it was first talked about, they said that there were about 30 something people who actually died. It was at least 300. Right. And all the businesses were burned. So I just want you, it's a, it was a racial massacre. That's how you need to look at it. This is how I feel about it. Just imagine, just close your eyes for a second and think, Donald Trump is standing in Tulsa. The backdrop has Confederate flags and make America great and Trump flags flying in the air. You're, it's on the day where we celebrate the emancipation of slaves. And then 
It's in a place where we were literally massacred on a false accusation and really out of jealousy of the success that blacks had built in this country. Mm-hmm. And that you is should, the you day. Should, you, you should highlight that part. The, the, there was, there was, and I didn't, I'm sorry, but uh-huh. that there, there was jealousy from, well, not even jealousy. The, a lot of these black uh, business owners in on black wall street in Tulsa were doing better than their white counterparts. Yes. And there had been a long standing history of sort of animus about the fact that they were doing so well. Absolutely. So just imagine that and knowing all of that and you have people in Congress that are upset about this, that are complaining to Donald Trump about it. He could easily pick another day, but Mm. no, he's picking this day. And I don't think it's a day to that. He's like, I actually want to honor Juneteenth. So this to me is Donald Trump saying a big fuck you to black people Mm. and a big yes. Sorry, mom. There's no other word. That's what I feel like he's saying. And it's a rally for white people, white supremacists, mm. those, the, those supporters that will be waving those type of flags at this rally that he's having. For the first time ever, this is the date you pick? Come on now. I don't think that's the, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't think that's the point of this rally. I think Trump no, it's is a presidential be, rally. I know, I know. But I think in this particular rally, Trump is going to make an attempt to reach out to the black community. Oh, he- let's, let's take a, let's do let's, a let's poll. Make a bet. Let's do let's a make poll. A bet. And we're going to do a Twitter poll. Do you think Trump's Juneteenth celebration is to celebrate blacks in America? Wait, <laughs> let, 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 oh, hold on for go, a second. Fine, hold go on for ahead a second. Say what your, let's what make your sure we get this right. Is. I'm not saying that it's going to be a genuine <laughs> attempt a good attempt, I but I think that what he is trying to do is going into an election year, an election in November, seeing kind of what the country is. Trump is going to get all of the Trump blacks, all of his Trump blacks, his Trumpians um, in out Tulsa. There. In Tulsa, he's going to fly them in. Oh, okay. He's really like I guarantee you that when you see the "Make America Great" thing, "Make a Great, Make a Great, Make a Great Again" thing in the background, I can't even. Fucking you can't say even say it because you hate it. When, <laughs> no, well, you well, like, when, when you see it, in a, you're gonna see tons of black faces on that stage with Donald Trump. He's well, he's going he to try to do that. that. Though there's always some minority standing behind him saying Latinos for Trump, blacks for Trump. That's always the case at the rallies. Right. We always see those fill-ins, but no. I think it's the exact opposite. I think it is an election year. And at this point, there's so much that's happening with the economy, which was what he was standing on before. There's unemployment going on. There's the pandemic. And you've got all these racial issues in the country. Trump's like, you know what? That's a lost cause. I got to appeal to the people who voted for me the first time. So that's all this rally is doing to him. He is appealing to the audience that is going to elect him. He has given up, I think, at the black vote at this point. Okay, so this is what uh, Kaylee oh, McKinney. Her, her. How, how do you say her name? Her. Kaylee. It's like it's like McKinney. They, they, McK- McKinney. 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 It's like they spit them out. She used to be on CNN. I remember her. Like they, it's like they spit them out of a like a conveyor belt. It's like you press a button. It's an Ann Coulter. You press a button. It's a Kaylee. <laughs> you press a button. It's like a conveyor belt. You know, whatever. It's a Tommy. It's a Tommy Laren. A Tommy. Um, uh, she says. He will, she says, Trump will share some of the progress that has been made for black Americans. Okay. And she Mm -hmm. says that the black American community is near and dear to President Trump's heart. And at this, (laughs) (laughs) we near and dear. Exactly. It's near and dear to his heart. And so he's going to share a lot of, um, of what he's done, citing criminal justice reform, funding for HBCUs, and he's working on rectifying other injustices. So it's a meaningful day for him, and he's going to talk to black people. That's what Kaylee McEnany, 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 Kaylee McConaughey. That's what she said <laughs> during the. Uh, this is her day. job. She is the new. She is the press secretary. This is what she mm-hmm. does. She speaks because we no longer can do press conferences with Trump anymore. So now mm-hmm. this is what she does. 
She speaks on his behalf. She's speaking because he's being criticized for having it on this day. Now, black people are going to be out celebrating on Juneteenth. They're not going to be at this rally listening to what Trump has to say about what really digging deep to try to figure out what he's done for the black community when there's a laundry list of things he's done against the black community that he showed his hand about how he truly feels about blacks. You can go all the way back to the 70s with that. I mean, come on. This is so, a big F you. Yeah, so here's the thing about President Trump. President Trump was running for president, right? And when he was running for president, he got support and endorsements from various white supremacist groups, right? Um, including the mascot, the American mascot for white supremacy, who's David Duke, okay? <laughs> uh, from? David Duke is from Louisiana, okay? Just okay. Saying. David Duke is from Louisiana. You know what? You know what? <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to, let's look up a, a list of fucked up people from Texas. <laughs> that, that, that's the, like, you know, I, like it, it's like David Duke is from Louisiana. Like, I'm I just, a, I'm people a, might not know who he is. And I just felt like we just needed to give some more background, but go ahead. You're right. Oh, the mascot. I just, I found somebody from Texas. Adolf Hitler was born right outside of Houston. <laughs> It's just, I'm looking at this right. Stop. I'm looking at this right now. It says uh, Hitler. Hitler was born right outside of the, the Houston. He's from, <laughs> you know, those Beaumont, the Beaumont be Hitler family. It would be Vider. That Vider. would be the. It'd be Vider. Vider, yes. Vider, or Sugarland, the Sugarland Hitlers. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, no, but so uh, President Trump refused to uh, disavow or distance himself um, or condemn is a better word Mm -hmm. while Van does his word search, uh, an endorsement from David Duke. Yeah. That's all I need to know. The white supremacists, the white supremacists both in action and in thought that are surrounding President Trump will be empowered as long as he's in office. He refuses to depower them. And white supremacy, when we're talking about that, we're not talking about something that results even in the lynching that has happened to black people before. We're talk- not talking about the terrorist acts that have happened uh, to black Americans, like ha- what happened uh, with the Black Wall Street massacre. We're talking about an entire system of white supremacy. Mm-hmm. In a system of white supremacy, the oftentimes the horrific crimes are the least dangerous part. And that seems weird to say because the crimes are a lot of times so egregious that they get sympathy and they get people's emotions worked up. So when you see a black man get dragged until his head falls off, when you hear stories about uh, people being hung and having their balls cut off and all of those things like that, those are things that most rational Americans would look at and think that's horrible for Mm -hmm. that to happen to a human being. The other parts about white supremacy that get, empowered by guys like Trump are the parts that you can't see that are actually working every second or every day to maintain an American status quo where black Americans can't access their part of the American dream. Mm -hmm. And those are things like federal judges that the president would appoint. Mm -hmm. Those are things uh, like about oversight. Um, Those are things about funds that would get to black people and black neighborhoods all over the place to sort of political people or politicians, should I say, that President Trump has to empower in order to do what he is. The Trump administration has empowered the worst group of federal judges in terms of civil rights in a generation, maybe ever. So that's the work being done against the Black community that it's impossible to see, but the type of work that can only be done if there is someone who values the support of white supremacists in the White House, who values their supports. Now, I'm not saying that there haven't been other presidents who value that. I'm not saying that at all. I'm sure that there's large bases of people that come even from, I I joke about Louisiana, that come even from my home state that value that support as well because it's a stable base. But this president has been, to me, very, very, very public, overt, um, and forthcoming 
about the types of people that he likes to surround himself with. And that threatens the fabric of America. So then that's why you have to look at the fact that he is, of all days, starting his campaign rallies on Juneteenth. It is a big F you to black people, especially with what's going on in this country right now. And there is no acknowledgement by the president to mend it, to fix it, to recognize it when you're honoring a police force by saying 99% of them are good and there's no systemic racism, when you refuse to rename of U.S. Army facilities that are named after Confederate leaders, when you want to keep statutes up, when you when you honor the Confederate flag, all of that is a big F you to black people. And mm-hmm. so I feel like the fact that he's doing this on this day goes into that. Trump has a long history of saying mm-hmm. racist you know, xenophobic, what, whatever things that are against sure. the black community. And the only things he stands on are that I love black people. I like, you know, I, I like black people. That's what mm-hmm. he'll say. Or he'll talk about the job increase with, with black people since he's been the president. That's he's going to talk about the, and at the That's rally, it. he's going to, he's going to talk about $250 million that he didn't give to HBCUs. He did. He stopped it from not expiring. He's also probably going to talk about the first step Act, and the first step act was, um, and we'll give America credit for at least getting this right. The First Step Act was a bipartisan criminal justice reform mm-hmm. um, that passed under the Trump administration. So he's certainly, and there are going to be people there that are going to be able to say that they got out of jail um, yeah. during the Trump administration. Alex Johnson and people like that. Uh, so he's probably going to say that. But what I'm saying is he doesn't have a real case, but he's going to make the case He's going to try to and make that's the case enough. to black Americans. The people who will write me about when I say something about the president on my social media always bring up those two things. It's two things. That's all mm-hmm. that they say. They forget everything else that he's done. And I think that he's showing his hand in what we have going on right now in our country. And the fact that there is no there's no effort to fix it or to mm-hmm. even recognize and acknowledge it shows me all that I need to. So, I, I mean, are you going to be tuning in? On June 10th, I, I don't, to the I don't rally? watch that. I don't watch that shit. And no, and most, and, and neither will most black Americans. Right. Except for maybe the eight percent that voted for him. This is what Kaylee said, the eight percent that voted for him last uh, time. What what's your what's your feelings on the uh on the Confederate flag? You know? <laughs> Talk about <laughs> Wait, it. Can you re ask the question? What's I mean, my feelings on the Confederate flag? I mean, I hate like, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hate it. You know, we well, I, we we, we better, have be, this. Go ahead. Be, better better question. What's your feeling mm-hmm. on large portions of the country's inability to see why you hate the Confederate flag? Well, OK, we we've been joking all podcasts about this, but we're both from the South. You're from yes. Louisiana. I'm from Texas. Mm-hmm. So it is not abnormal to see the Confederate flag on the back of a car I remember the school I went to. There were kids who either had it on their cars, maybe had a picture of it in their in their locker. And it always is a very daunting presence for me. It like I can feel myself tighten up and become a bit fearful whenever I see a person that is using that as a symbol. And that's because of what it represents to black people. And we all know that what it was representing in the 19th century and with secession and the union and the defense of slavery and the rejection of patriotism and nationalism, we all get that. But what I think people don't realize is then there was the Confederate flag. It was still around, but it was kind of you didn't really see it arise anywhere. And the reason it came back is because they were using it to condemn the civil rights movement. Whites who were against it brought the Confederate flag back as a symbol to reject what was happening in the country for American African-Americans, there I am like you, Blacks, fighting for their equality in this country. They used the Confederate flag as a symbol to oppose that. That is why when I see it, I immediately affiliate racist with it. I affiliate racism with it. I don't pay attention to NASCAR because I know where this conversation is going. I don't, I've never been to a race. We've got Texas Motor Speedway, which is not far away from where I grew up. Never wanted to affiliate it with it. It's not for us. Similar to the way we think about the Bachelor franchise, NASCAR is not for us. We know that. When I saw, since NASCAR has been a topic right now in the news, the picture, the video of the Confederate flags 
flying in the air, you know, whether it was their tailgate or infield or wherever they have it. It was the scariest feeling to me. I did not know that that's what it was like. And I can't believe Bubba Wallace was driving in this type of environment. It's not welcoming. It scares me. And it's a symbol of racism. It is not a symbol of Southern pride at all. If you know what the flag stands for, I feel like you almost have to have a history lesson on that, similar to why you tell people, non-Black people, they can't say the N-word. You need Hmm. to understand the deep rooted history of what that flag represents and why it's waved in the air and pulled out and who are the type right. of people that wave it. Right. So there's no passive way to, a, to, to, to wave the Confederate flag. I mean, um, and we should say something about the Confederate flag and people who are, um, who romanticize the Confederacy in general. So I, I made a joke about Hitler a little bit earlier, right? But there is something that's true regarding Hitler, the Nazis and Germany. So, the Nazis come in mm-hmm. and they come in almost as an alien force that takes about 13 or 14, 15 years, not really, but 10, 12, 13 years to take hold in Germany. But at some point, uh, Germany, after what went on in World War I, in the midway, in the break, and then to World War II, becomes susceptible to a demagogue and to a guy like Adolf Hitler. The Nazis take hold of Germany. The majority of the country goes along with it. Okay. A uh, great sin. They kill millions of people, six million Jews, six million other people. Mm -hmm. Uh, They wage a world war where they occupy France, they invade England, all of these things like that. They do horrible, horrible things. At the end of the Nazis' reign, the world gave Germany a choice. Uh, Reconcile and denazify yourself. Erase the most heinous, dangerous, and really sad part of your history, or you can't rejoin the world community. You can't be a part of the world community Mm -hmm. unless we are 100% crystal clear that the Nazis aren't going to rise in Germany again. Okay? And so, Germany had to denazify. There's a fantastic book called Exercising Hitler, um, written by a guy named Frederick Taylor, that'll tell you about the lengths that Germany had to go through in order to get the stain of the Nazis off them. Mm-hmm. That's a beautiful thing to me. Tell you why that's a beautiful thing. And it was a concerted effort to make sure that they had gotten rid of that. That same effort to reconcile, to uh, decontaminate, to build a new American society has never been made for black Americans. Mm -hmm. We have been told that we need to get over what happened, not just to our great grandfathers, but to our grandfathers and grandmothers, our aunts and uncles and everyone going all the way back from great, great, great to great, to great, to on and to now. You're privileged to live in America. You're privileged to be here. Forget about it. Get over it. Right. On top of that, we're expected to live and build a society with people who keep reminding us Hmm. about the point in our lives where we were less than human. Yeah. As far as this country was concerned. So in Louisiana, there is no statue of PBS Pinchback, who was the first black governor of Louisiana, only served for a little while, but ended up nearly becoming a senator, fought with, uh, um, is a group down in New Orleans uh, called the Native Unit that was made up, uh, he fought in the Union Army. There's no, there's no statues of him, right? Right. No statues of him, but there's statues of Beauregard and there's statues of Jackson and there's statues of Lee and there's statues of all of these people who... Not only were they racist, but they were losers. (laughs) So here in America, I'm to be told that black winners mean less than white losers. Right. Black people who fought on the side of just and good, which is what the Union Army, at least as far as history is concerned, represented because it represented the end of slavery, don't matter as much 
as guys who tried with all of their will and all of their might to continue slavery, to continue a system of degradation for black people and um, to treat us like shit. So when people say that the Confederate flag is Southern pride, you don't get to make that decision. You don't get to make the, you don't get to redefine something that has a very clear definition. Well, he, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's it. Look I at mean, me. that's it. And so it's, it, and so that, that's it. And so to, to be honest with you, it's, it's not just a, a stupid argument, but in and of itself, it's an offensive one. Mm-hmm. So just say what the fuck you want to say to me because your shirt or your bumper sticker or your flag or your fucking statue is already saying it. Right. Just talk to me like you want to talk to me, say what the fuck you want to say, and we can get it out the mud some other way. Yeah, and don't hide behind the flag and act like it's a Southern pride thing. Because my thing is, is I never understood that when they would say that, because there are a million other things that you could pick to have Southern pride, to represent that, other than the Confederate flag. The Confederate flag represents treason. It doesn't Mm -hmm. represent anything about being a patriot of this country or nationalism or anything like that. It truly represents treason in addition to the defense of slavery and something negative to black people. I I, I just will never understand why they try to hide. Well, I know. Take that back. I know exactly why they try to do it, but to defend it or to defend the people who represent that, you got a president who is sitting here calling these people heroes. He is deeming them. You say they're losers and you are 100% correct, but you got a president who doesn't want to remove these statues, who doesn't want to remove, change the names of these army facilities because he regards them as heroes, heroes of our country. He doesn't regard them as anything. Fucking President Trump doesn't know who Stonewall Jackson is. President Trump, <laughs> do, he, he, like he he do, he he doesn't, I know man. He doesn't. Like, like president, like President Trump, but that's doesn't what know he says. Shit or Kaylee about says Robert it. E. Lee, he doesn't know shit about Jefferson Davis. No, he I doesn't agree know, with you. He, like he doesn't know, he doesn't know anything about but any of those guys. What he does know, though, is that his base thinks that's that they are heroes. That's what I was about to say. That that's what people need to realize. Everything that he is doing at this point is for the election. We are in an election year. When he opened up churches again, that was him playing into his base and his audience of the people who will vote for him. The reason he will not condemn the Confederacy and the people who fought within it and the flag and what it represents is because this is his audience. You have to understand this. That he is at least smart enough to know that. He might not know who yeah. these people are, but right. he knows that. You don't know shit, man. I'm sick <laughs> of it. Uh, election. You said the President Trump is trying to run an election. You know who's trying to make sure that he doesn't win that election? LeBron James. LeBron James uh, is um he's getting out there. He's mobilizing again. You can't say that LeBron doesn't fucking put his money and his time where his mouth is. He now has a new initiative. It's called more than a vote, I think it's called. Is it yep, more than a vote? That's what it is. And so uh, LeBron James is mobilizing kids, African Americans, not just African Americans, but people, the young, the young whippersnappers, okay, <laughs> that are uh, okay. sort of uh, that he resonates with to get out there and vote, to register to vote. And he's, I think, if I'm right about this, he is focusing his effort on getting voters in the swing states. Am I right about this? Or is this I, just like a nationwide thing? Because I had heard that it was going to be about the swing states, but maybe it is not. I think I'm like, I'm like looking at it as I'm talking to you. I think it's a nationwide thing because we've been talking about this whole, what happened to voter die? What happened to voter die? And you talked about some of the things that they wish that they had rectified or fixed when it came to the whole voter die campaign. But that's what this is. And so I know that it's in, it's aimed to inspire blacks to register and to cast a ballot, but it's also going to educate them about certain things like uh, voter suppression. And I love this, okay? I'm not the biggest LeBron James fan, but I love everything he does off the court. Mm -hmm. And I love that he has always said he wants his legacy to go beyond the basketball court. And the fact that he's doing this and he's leading this and he's recruiting other athletes to help him out with this, 
makes me the biggest fan of him. And even though, and, and even a lot of times when we talk about voting, we talk about just, you got to get registered to vote. You got to get registered to vote. But what he's doing, this more than a vote campaign is educating you on what it actually is that you're voting for and how to vote. And I love it that he's equipping you with the tools you need when you go cast your ballot. It's almost mm. like a tutorial. That's the, that's what I'm gathering Mm-hmm. with this which is bigger than vote or die so you don't vote necessarily by party you know exactly what it is you're voting for and i think it's important to be educated because when you face somebody who votes against you you can tell them exactly why you're voting you know for this person or against it because you're going to be equipped with that knowledge mm. i love this i'm all about this it's a beautiful thing thank you lebron james for this yeah i love it especially in the in the context that it exists in number 1 when you think about it Hillary lost 2016 by about 80,000 votes. Mm -hmm. That was the difference, right? So three states, you look at Wisconsin, I think Michigan, and then Pennsylvania. If you look at those three states, if Hillary does a point better in each place, she wins, okay? So you talk about 80,000 votes uh, separated, and I'm doing the electoral math right there. Mm -hmm. 80,000 votes kept Hillary out of the White House. And, you know, I know that people have issues with Hillary Clinton. They have issues with the Clintons. And sure. I'll, I'll be the first person to admit, rightfully so. If you have issues with Joe Biden, rightfully so. It, like, when you look at Joe Biden's record, when you look at some of the things that the Clintons have been involved in, it's, it's completely not just okay. If you were educated on it, you'd be a fucking fool not to have some issues. The question is, what is it that you're voting for, right? What right. are you voting for? Um, right now, Mitch McConnell's the most powerful man in the country. Mitch McConnell says what goes. Mitch McConnell wields a lot of uh, of power in terms of being able to move the, the engine of politics in our world right now. Mm-hmm. So when you're voting, you're not just voting for the president. You're going to vote down ballot. And also, you're essentially voting for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You're essentially voting for <laughs> for Supreme Court uh, nominations and the future of Roe versus Wade. Yes, you're you essentially are. you're essentially voting for so many things like that. And if Joe Biden doesn't do it for you, or if Hillary Clinton doesn't do it for you, maybe having the rights over your body might do it for you. Uh, Maybe down the line, voting for governors who might not fuck up districts and redraw lines so that your people don't have as much of a say in state and local politics. Maybe that might do it for you. Mm -hmm. But you need to chalk up your values and see what kind of country you want to live in. And sometimes that means that you get a less than ideal candidate in the number one slot. And I'm going to be honest with you. If I looked up less than ideal candidate in the fucking dictionary, (laughs) there would be a fucking gigantic picture of Joe Biden. I'm waiting for Joe Biden. I wouldn't be surprised if on uh, Juneteenth, Joe Biden did like a like a, 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 a cross sort of counter rally to Donald Trump and went, listen, you guys know me. I was in there with Barack Obama. He was great. He loved me. Okay. And he was just about the best color guy I ever met. (laughs) Like I'm waiting for some, I'm waiting for some shit like that to happen. We already heard it. You ain't black. Right. I'm waiting. (laughs) So, so I'm saying is obviously not the perfect candidate, but there are so many more things on the ballot. When I say on the ballot, there are so many more things that you vote for. Exactly. Other than the man, his blood and his DNA. There's, there's, there's more stuff. There's a whole apparatus that you're voting. But that's why I love this initiative that LeBron is doing because I, I don't know all what it's going to entail. I mean, this has just been announced, but I am hoping that it lets you know those things. When you vote for the president, you're not just voting who gets the title and who's going to be living in the White House. It is about who is appointing federal judges on the district, the appellate, the Supreme Court level, all that matters. Like you said, these cases that have been pretty much navi- like how we navigate the judicial system for so long are on the verge of being overturned. You know, mm-hmm. it's even on a 
like you said, with the governors on a local level, it's just so important to know what it exactly it is you're voting for. And I think that's why people feel like their vote doesn't matter and their vote doesn't count because they don't understand exactly what it means when you cast that ballot, how much power yeah. you have in that. And for nothing else, and I always say this, and it still baffles my mind that I used to say this to black people. People died so we could vote. If nothing mm-hmm. else, exercise the right that people fought, not people, your people fought mm-hmm. so hard for. I just don't understand you know, why you, know, you wouldn't You know, do know it's that. crazy. You know, I actually don't like it when people say that. You know why? Why? I, like Because I said like, it? No, that's not why, Big Rach. I don't like it. Why? It's because like, People died so that black people could do everything. <laughs> like, well, okay, well, then like die. people, like, wait, 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 wait. It's like, it's like saying, it's like, I get it, I get the sentiment, but it's like, that would be like me not going to get lunch at Denny's, and then someone going, no, hey, man, it's not. That, you need to go get lunch at Denny's. You need to go get lunch at Denny's because no. people died no. so you could get lunch at Denny's. They but died you know, so you could sit do, in a but restaurant. Do you know, but dude, that's true. People but the, died but so that I could Denny's. go to Denny's. But you, but you exercise people died that so that I could ride. People died so that I could ride the bus. But you people exercise died, like, people, that. It's nothing that you. There's nothing that you could do as a black person that people didn't die so that you could do it. It's but like you it's have like, a choice now. You have. Very you, true. You know what I'm saying? I get what Before, you're saying. There was no choice. You could. You, now you can decide. You know what? I don't want to go sit. Uh, in an integrated restaurant that that wasn't given to I wanna, you. I want to. I want to go. I mean, to be honest with you, Denny's might not be the safest place to go. I mean, Denny's just has its issues, but I like going and sit down there. So I'm happy that people got their so asses just, busted just so I could go eat lunch. What the fuck? God, god damn! Look, I'll say this. Okay. You said that your vote doesn't matter, and I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm gonna level with you guys. Some of y'all, your vote doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm, gonna be, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be real with you. Uh, I'm gonna be like, I'm going to keep it all the way gangster. Like, if you live here in L.A., I got bad news for you. Your vote doesn't really matter. In terms of president, it doesn't matter. I want you to go out and vote. And the reason why is because I want people to get, I want to see a more active, engaged American electorate. But just, just to let you know, I don't mean to, like, fuck with the drama. This he doesn't mean that, blue. you guys. He doesn't this mean that. He stays going blue. But what I'm telling you, this is what I'll tell you. I'll tell you, if you live in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, um, if you live in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Florida. Oh, I know. I've, I've changed my license like, just like for o- this. Ohio, even maybe Virginia. There are a lot of states in there. I'm saying you don't just matter. You fucking really matter. Like we need you young kids. You got all the fucking time in the world to play Fortnite or like go and hang out with Lil Uzi Vert or whomever. Okay. You sound you like got, the oldest person in the I, room I am right old, now. Look, look, I'm just, I'm telling you guys, I'm telling you guys, everybody that protested, I swear to you, if you mobilize in November, yes, the same way that you protested, at least we can begin to have a functional conversation about changing some of the systems in America. Now, let me tell you this. This is not me saying that the Democrats are your friends. I am not saying that. You have no friends. Okay. Okay. Like you, you, you don't. But what I'm saying is, if we're going to leverage our culture to get to make a better America for not just Black Americans, but for the entire country, for mm-hmm. other parts of this country that have been overlooked and put to the background. And like when I say working people, I mean working people are losing with income inequality. Working people are fucking losing when uh, yeah. w- with with COVID. Working people, working people are being left behind in America, and we have to change that. And the political apparatus is going to be a part of that uh, prescription to change it. That's all. Mm-hmm. That's it. I'm not about to. I'm not saying I hey. I'm a, I'm a registered independent. I'm a liberal. I'm liberal as fuck. But I don't believe that. I knew you, know, you were going independent. Well, what do you mean you knew I was going independent? How well, did you know I mean, I was you're like Democrats aren't our friends, Republicans aren't our friends. I get it, independent. Like, yeah, I, yeah there's nothing wrong with it. Father's yeah. an independent. It seems like it seems like there's a little judginess in your voice. Not at all. Right. Okay. Not at all. Right. I am one of those people who is, you know, I'm from Texas. I am literally changing my license right now to Florida so I can vote in Florida because I know this state needs my vote. Texas might be in play. 
I'm going to do Florida. I get you. <laughs> Texas, I'm just letting no, you know. Te- Texas, no, I know. Texas I- might be in play. The Texas is it's like Texas. We'll, well, we're going to have. The major cities in Texas are all like everything in surround. No, I'm not surrounding. But Texas is, yeah, it's on the verge because of the bigger cities. For sure. By the way, here on the Higher Learning Podcast, we're going to have all the experts you need to hear on all of this stuff like checking in right here. We're going to give you all the information that you need in terms of, uh, you know, balloting how we beat voter suppression is going to be very, very important. Mm. One thing that the LeBron thing is doing is if the more people you can get out, there's going to be widespread voter suppression come November. The more people you get out, the more you can fight some of the voter suppression uh, that exists in this country. We're going to see it everywhere. We just saw it. In Georgia, people yeah. standing and waiting six or seven hours to try to vote. That is trying to get people not to vote. Exactly. They're scared of your vote. They're scared of your power. Exactly. And that was just the primaries. So people are mm-hmm. like, I ain't coming back for November if this is how it's going to be. No, 100% right. Yes. Mm. I love that. We will have people out here. Okay. Are we going to talk protesting? We're going sure, to touch on a little bit. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't I feel like there's not a whole lot to say other than you guys protesting. If you had asked me before if we would still be protesting here weeks after the murder of George Floyd, I wouldn't have believed it. But I love to see it. And I want to know I want everyone to know that your protesting is having effects on what's happening in this country. It's a whole there's a whole movement behind it. I mean, TV shows are getting canceled. Movies are getting ripped from. Mm-hmm. Uh, streaming services, people are getting fired from their jobs. I mean, it's if you are not on the right side of this, you're out. And that is mm-hmm. because you guys are out in these streets, marching, protesting, using your voices, fighting for what you believe is right. So all I have to say is keep it going. Yeah. Keep doing yeah. it. The world will change as much as you as you pressure it to. I will say this. Don't just protest, though. Like, Go into a bank with Kente Colato on and ask for a home loan. Like, I'm serious. Like, don't don't just I got, leave I got it. you on the latter part. Like, don't, <laughs> don't, don't just leave it at the protesting, right? Man, put some pressure on Bank of America. Oh, Bank of America, you down with Black Lives Matter? Guess what? I want to open a soul food joint. What kind of collateral do you have? I have 400 years of collateral. <laughs> Give me $150,000 now. If not, <laughs> we show up outside the Bank of America. Put your kente cloth on. And by the way, this is not just black people. Kente cloth now is a it's sign. It's for everybody. Hey, <laughs> it's for everybody. White people in these cities, get you some kente cloth, man. Get out there. Since we all, <laughs> since we make it, since everything is a fucking, <laughs> get out there in your kente cloth. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. I can't. <laughs> we live in a kente cloth world. <laughs> There's going to be a flag. That's going to be the new thing that's waving the in NASCAR. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, that's the best idea. Ding that. I need a ding right there. Uh, this is the first fantastic idea that Rachel Lindsay has had. <laughs> and we will, she will have more. But that is, if you know what? Hold on. Fuck it. We just came up with something. NASCAR, if you really want to show how down you are, this is true. forget about just getting rid of the, because you get rid of a flag, so what? You need another flag. Fly that KC, Kente Cloth flag. I want to see Kente Cloth flags at all NASCAR yeah. events. Make us feel welcome. Make us yeah. feel, you already got a Black Lives Matter car. That's what Bubba's driving. Make us right. feel appreciated. Welcome. What's one we- thing? What, what's one thing NASCAR could do to make you feel appreciated and welcome at a race? Well, I already told you. But in addition to that, right before the, you know how like when it's Canada and Mm -hmm. U.S. at a game, basketball game, you hear both anthems. I would like to hear Lift Every Voice and Sing played right after the national anthem or before. If you're real, play it before. Would that make you feel welcome? (laughs) You have issues with Lift Every Voice and Sing? Come on. I don't don't, don't have I don't have issues with Lift Every Voice and Sing. I love the song, but I just think it's songs that black people like more. You know what I mean? They may, but I, that, histo- I feel like there's like a history of it, if that's what it represents. I, th- I feel like e- my think, sister my sister went to Spelman and she said that was one of the things they made her memorize when she first got there. Man, and watched sister, school days. <laughs> your, sister went to Spe- your sister went to Spelman and she still married a white dude? That's crazy. I'm not going to let you sit on this podcast and dog <laughs> my sister like that. <laughs> no. Yes, okay. she did. And? Man, good for her. I'm not tripping. <laughs> <laughs> like she like undercooked meat. That's all on her. Like I'm not. Wow. Tri- I'm not. I'm not. Look, I'm. I'm not tripping. 
Love who you love. <laughs> it's serious. I don't give a fuck. Good for y'all. Like, like, girl, all I want to see is happy people. I just want people right. to be happy, Rachel. I just want oh, people yeah. to be happy. Um, but yeah, I think that if you play what's going on, black people were it, they would go crazier than if you played oh, lift I, every voice and sing. And they probably know the words more to what's going on right. and they do right. lift every voice and sing. I agree. Mm-hmm. But no, but that to answer your question, that would make me feel welcome. What would make you feel welcome? Um what made me feel what a good question. What Bar- made barbecue, me feel barbecue, maybe barbecuing in the tailgate. Like, what do we do? Wow. Maybe if there was like a mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. What would I, that's a good question. I'm gonna think about that for the next podcast. When, in the next podcast, what we're gonna do. The next podcast, we're gonna come with a comprehensive plan for NASCAR. NASCAR we're gonna come is on with, it. We're gonna come with a package for NASCAR. It's it's our job. We're gonna come up. As a matter of fact, do me a favor. Okay. Everyone that listens to Higher Learning, all of our thought warriors. Hit me and Rachel up on the internets, on the Twitter spheres, <laughs> on the social medias, all of this. What's give me a good package for NASCAR? What can NASCAR do to really get black people in the stands? I want to know what do you think they should do? Hashtag NASCAR package. And then we're going to take this package and we're going to use it in other sports, right? We're going to then give it to the National Hockey League. Okay. Maybe maybe okay. give it maybe give it to curling. Okay. Maybe give it to golf. You know what I'm saying? Okay. We got we gonna yeah. start a whole new movement here. Right, right. It's time. It's time. Um. Okay. So we're going to the end, but before we come to the end, I'm gonna ask you. Can I have a little space? Of course. Okay. So yesterday, I lost a friend. And <clears throat> the culture lost a friend. Uh, a woman named Jazz Waters, Jasmine Waters, Jazz Fly on Twitter. She was absolutely brilliant. She was a writer. She was an essayist, a blogger. She had written movies. She had written books. Uh, but more than anything, she was a light, a fantastic individual, um, a fierce ally of anyone who needed a voice, uh, an activist, all of those things. She was amazing. Jazz, earlier this week, um, took her own life. We found out about it yesterday. Uh, And it was devastating. I don't have the. uh, I met Jazz through Charlemagne some years ago. And one of the greatest sort of testaments to the impact that she had on everyone was when I was talking to people yesterday about her passing. People continuously said. I don't know if you remember, but Jazz introduced us. I don't know if you remember, but she's the reason why I know you. I don't know if you remember, but she gave me my first read or my first writing job or whatever. It's when something like this happens, it's a uh, you like you struggle for ways to sort of um figure out like how things could have been different and like what everyone who knew her and loved her and the outpouring of love has been from every side of this industry and this culture. Uh, You know, she wrote on kidding. She wrote on this is us. She wrote uh, the Will Packer movie. um, What women want. She just has so much great work and she was always, 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 always creating. Uh, I want to make sure that people realize the moment that we've been in in the last couple of months. A lot of people who depend on sort of outside forms of structure, who depend on maybe going out, being around people, maybe connecting with people in creative ways and social ways, they haven't had that. And instead, what they've had to do is sit in some of the parts of themselves that might pull on them 
and maybe pull them off of a cliff. So, when I think about my friend and I think about what happened, I think about other people in my life that I can provide structure for and give them soft beds to lay on when things get hard. And we get caught up in what's going on with us. We get caught up in what's going on with with uh, with our lives, but it really matters being attached to people. It really matters feeling close to them. It really matters feeling that they feel that they're a part of something. And more than anything, that's why I think she wanted for everyone, which is why she was so keen on getting people together. One time when Black Panther came out, Jazz threw an event where 500 kids that weren't going to be able to see the movie got a chance to go and see the movie for free. She brought out little Yachty and Migos and she herself had been adopted and she knew what film and television, how it empowered her. And she just wanted somebody else to feel that feeling. And the biggest part of this is that when she needed it, nobody could make her feel that feeling. More than anything, make someone feel that feeling of inclusion and love and fulfillment and grace, if you can. There's a lot wrong, but every day you can be somebody's right. I'm going to miss my friend. We're going to ask ourselves questions, but hopefully her life has been a testament and she's not defined by her how her life ended. She's defined by what she did every single day to enrich everybody else's lives. And I just want her to know that I love her. I want everyone that's in pain from this to know that I feel that same pain and that uh hopefully in some way that when the wound scabs over, it'll be tougher to break the next time. But I love you, Jazz. Uh and that's it. I just wanted to take the time to say that. Um, and everybody be well. I'm sorry to end the podcast on <laughs> such a bummer. No. But I had, yeah, I just got to, you know, make sure everybody knows how much I love my own girl. So I think it's well said. And I appreciate you honoring your friend. You guys, if you know anyone out there who is suffering, who needs some type of support, please give them the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline phone number, which is 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. Okay, so we are out. Uh, we appreciate you um, sticking with us today on How We're Learning. How we're learning. We appreciate everything, like, you know, continue to think. And seriously, you know, help us out. Help us think as far as how NASCAR is going to make this right. I'm serious about this. I want this to happen. All right, guys, we're out of here. I'm Van Lathan. I'm Rachel Lindsay. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.